All right, have a seat. Woo! That was fun. Hope you enjoyed that. Don't miss next week. Easter is going to be a blast. So I encourage you to be here. Welcome to our service this morning. Um, I, I, we're in our series, Disciple Shift, and so we're going to continue that today. I didn't get enough time to get really as deep as I wanted to get in this series, but that's okay. We, we're going to move on um, and uh, start with uh, the, uh, the cross of Christ next week at Easter time. And so you guys show up for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a great time Easter. Uh, the world's craziest Easter egg hunt always takes place right here. And so I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I was thinking uh, <clears throat> yesterday, I, you know, I don't know exactly what God's doing in our world today. Um, I could tell you I knew where he was heading and what the epics and the times were. Uh, but I would be lying, okay? There, there's, there's a fine line between, uh, you know, prophesying and prophet lying, okay? And some pastors cross that. Uh, easily, uh, famous theologian, great poet Robert Soto told me that line. <laughs> told me that right there. And so, um, uh, but and so if, if I if I told you I knew that, I, I, I would be wrong. I, I don't know. The Bible tells us it's not for us to know the times and the epics. We don't have to know all those things. Now, I know this: that God never does anything for His people that's not glorious. Absolutely. And you can trust Him in that. And you can believe that. So uh, God has called us as the church to be about his purpose, a very specific purpose, that he will bring, as crazy as it looks in the world around us, to its glorious end. And he's in charge of that. You can tell me about solar this and electric that, and uh, I don't care. That's okay. Uh, you can tell me about this changing, that changing, Oh, Mother Earth ain't going to make it. No, no, it's in the hands of Jesus, guys. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And, and, yeah, and, and he's going to bring it to his glorious end that he will bring it to at the time that he decides to do that. But meanwhile, God's called us to a very specific purpose in being his influence and being his example, being his, his uh, love to this world that we live in. And what, what the enemy, Satan, would like to do is make sure that we don't get very focused on that. He'd love to keep us off just a little bit, that we don't stay very unified, that we don't stay very focused, that we won't stay very committed, that we won't stay very driven of the, at the things of God, okay? And so last week I got to talk to you about our commitment to God's Word. And, and I talked to you about living, that we need to be a people of the Word. We need to be people that live in God's Word. So I talked about living in the Word. Part of disciple shift is really learning to live in God's Word. And uh, I stay there. Guys, I can tell you, I know every, every time I preach a sermon, you're like, man, you got like eight verses of Scripture in here, 10 or something, Pastor. Well, that's because I preach the Bible, okay? And so the Bible's there. It's going to be all over it. If it's if I'm making a point, it's going to be in the Bible somewhere, okay? So that's just kind of the way I do that. Um, and, and I try to do that the, the, the best that I can. But so we've got to live, we've got to be people of the Word. We've got to live in the Word. But secondly, we have to live in the love of Christ. So we have to be people of the Word, but we also have to be people of God's love, okay? I've, I've known some people in my life that were great people of the Word, but they were like the meanest human beings I'd ever met before. That's not the way the church is supposed to be, Okay? Because we have to have that basis in God's Word, and then we also have this basis in God's love. And so that's what I want to kind of talk to you about today. It's about how we're going to live in that love, because there has to be the fullness of love in our lives for us to be what God wants us to be. And so we have to learn to fully love the Lord. We have to uh, learn to fully love other believers, and we have to learn to fully love people that are far away from God, people that are separated from God, people that are lost and don't have a commitment spiritually to God. We have to love them too. We have to love, learn to love all three of those groups if we're going to have the fullness of God's love in our life. And so that's just something that we're going to have to learn. 
So we need to fully love uh, God. So n- number one, in, 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 the way, in the three ways that we're going to really you know, develop the love that God wants us to develop, number one is we have to have a full love for God. We have to love the Lord God. Why? Why do we need to love God? Because he first loved us, the scripture says. Uh, 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because why? He first loved us, okay? We love him because he first loved us. Personally, I don't see this as a big challenge, do you? I mean, I think loving God is not a big challenge for me. I mean, is it really, is it hard for you to love a parent if that parent loves you and that parent provides for you and that parent helps you out and that parent encourages you and you have this healthy relationship with this parent, with your mom and your dad? Is it hard for you to love them back? No, that's not all that hard. I don't think this is a big challenge. I don't think loving a God who loved me first and sent Jesus to come and die on the cross for me, I don't see this as a great challenge. In fact, Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows us his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, okay? It'd be one thing if I'm loving this God who made me get my stuff together and made me be perfect before he gave me his love. But no, the scripture says, while you still, were in the middle of your crap, God loved you, okay? He didn't know if you were really ever going to come and believe in him and trust in him and give faith for him, but still Jesus came and died with the idea that hopefully we would respond to that sacrifice that's given for our sins. He didn't make us get it together first. He died for us. He loved us first before we ever begin to love him. And so therefore, it should be really a natural thing. I, don't, I think this is easy peasy, to love God, right? Don't you think it's that? I I think it's simple for us to love God because of the way God loved us. He showed us love for us. Uh, He went to the cross. He died on the cross for us. Uh, Before we did anything, he already loved us. And so if we're going to be the people that God wants us to be, we just have to learn to really love God because number one, he loved us first. But number two, he also commanded us to love him. The scripture says in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Okay, obviously I took the King James on that because I love the way that it says that. Okay, so we're actually commanded by God to love him. Okay, now there are just some parts of the Bible that are more clear than other parts. Okay. There's some part of the scripture that you can just say, oh, this is obviously a command from God. And anytime you see the word thou shalt, that's a command from God. And that's really easy to understand. It does not take a lot of deep theological interpretation for me to explain the thou shalt for you. Okay. These are the thou shalt. These are the commands. These are the things that are clear. In some places, the Bible just says, this is clear. You are commanded. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. It's not hard to understand. It's not hard to interpretate. We just kind of do it. We can interpret it. We can do it. It's really easy, okay? I mean, it's, I call it the thou shalt, but it's also the thou shalt, okay? It could be the S-H-O-U-T. You know, it's like they shout at us, okay? This is you see, this is one of those commands. Sometimes God gives us the commands that's like your children run into the traffic. It just makes sense that thou shalt stop. You know, don't do that. Okay, it's a shout. It's a thou shalt. Okay, so I see this as kind of the one, the thou shalt is keeping us from going into something that's going to be devastating for our lives. And so you kind of just have to shout it out. It's like God shouted, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You need to do that. Okay, so I think the thou shouts are very clear. This is one of those thou shouts that's given to us. And so uh, we want to, there's three ways that we want to live, and, and that's to fully love God, first of all. And we love him because, number one, he first loved us. Number two, he commands us, he shouts to us that we're supposed to love him. So we're following the thou shout when we love him. Number three, the Bible says that he fights for us. He's on our side. He's fighting for us. He's behind us. He's in our corner. We can always depend on him. Okay? He, he's, like, he's like cheering for us to, to move forward, to go ahead, to accomplish more in our lives. Okay? So he, he's just kind of kind of right there fighting for us. Who does he fight for? Who does God fight for? You can read, it's in all the Old Testament. Uh, It's everywhere you look in the Old Testament. It's in, you know, the poetry in the Old Testament. Uh, It's in the, you know, the Pentateuch of the Old Testament. It's in the prophets of the Old Testament. It's everywhere you look in the Old Testament and you see it also in the New Testament. Who does God fight for? He fights for his people. 
okay? Nobody stands up for anyone like they do their own people, right? You know, I've known some people, I've known some mamas that are really calm mamas, but if you mess with one of their little peoples, you're in trouble, right? Okay? And something big and powerful comes out of them, all right? That's the way God is. God always fights for his people. This is one of the reasons you want to love God. This is one of the reasons you want to be connected to God and, and, and be where God wants you to do, to, to be. In fact, Joshua 23, 10 says this, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Love him. Why? Because he fights for you. He's going to be there for you. Okay. Uh, I, I remember that when I was growing up, I had a little guy in my school and I say he was a little guy. He was actually a big guy and he was a little bit overweight. Okay. And so as school goes, most of the kids kind of made fun of him, but not me. I made him my friend. Guess what? All of that weight turned into muscle when we got older. And guess what? I loved having him on my side because I befriended him. And so, man, I walk around school like, man, nobody's going to mess with me. Why? Because I got a big friend, you know, that made the difference, right? And so when you have the Lord, it just kind of changes your walk a little bit because you know that the Lord is fighting for you. And so he fights for us. So we want to love God because we know that's been commanded. It's been shouted out to us. It's easy to understand that the Bible tells us we need to do that. That's going to bring uh, success and the glory of God in our lives. So we want to do that. But we also need to remind that he loved us first. He sent Jesus to us. Even when I didn't deserve it, while I was still a sinner, Jesus came and died on a cross for my sin, not even knowing if I would respond in a positive way to that. Yet he took that chance to love us first. And so I'm going to love him because he loved me first. And also I'm loving him because I know that the Lord is the one who's going to fight for me. And I want him on my side. I want him beside me. I know there's sometimes when you get in the battle, you really wonder, is there anybody on my side? And the reality is, if you're a believer, absolutely, God is always on your side. He's fighting for you. He fights for his people. He advocates for his people. He's there for you, and you can always depend on him. On him. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, am I his? Am I his? Did I give myself to him? Is God even able to fight for me? Have I surrendered myself to him so that he could be in my corner fighting for me? That's the question you have to ask. And you have to surrender yourself to God. <clears throat> you have to become his so that he can enter the fight on your behalf, okay? So the first, start, you know, the first step in really being the loving people, because God wants us to be loving people, is to love the Lord your God. You've got to start there, okay? So love God. The second point is this, number two, <clears throat> you have to fully love God other Christians. Oh, my soul, Pastor, you're challenging me now, okay? There's some Christians I don't know if I can love, okay? But God says that we need to love each other. It's very important that we learn to have the love of God towards each other because, number one, it just shows, it demonstrates that I am coming to know and understand God's love in the way that God wants me to, okay? When I begin to love others. 1 John 4, 7, this is how the Amplified Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is, our love springs, I love this, from God. I mean, love just jumps out from God. Love springs forth from the Lord, okay? It, 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 it comes out from God. So if you're, if you're God's, then love is going to jump out of you, okay? Uh, and, and he who loves his fellow men is begotten or born of God and is coming progressively to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better and clearer knowledge of God. You see that? Is that, that means you're growing deeper, okay? I mean, that, that means you're maturing a little bit. I'm perceiving who God is better, okay? I'm recognizing what God is all about better. I have a clearer knowledge of who God is. How do I know that? Because you're loving others better, other believers, okay? You're, you're, you're in the brotherhood, okay? And, and you're loving those, those believers that are around you. It's a sign of your spiritual growth. It's a sign that you're moving deeper, okay? Because God's love springs out of you, okay? We have, a little, we have a little Texas healer named Maya at our, at our house. And I, and I got this big sprinkler in my backyard that's on a big tripod. Some of you got these big tripod sprinklers. 
and it's in a sprinkler zone. That sprinkler is just shooting out. And, I let, and every time I turn it on, I see her run over there and she starts jumping up to get a drink out of it, okay? And she's like jumping way in the air to get a drink, jumping up. She's springing forth uh, to get refreshment, okay? And that, that's what this love of God does. It just kind of springs out of us. It jumps out of us. It's like it, it, it has super legs, okay? Now, guys, when you get my age, anything that involves springing is, is, is hard to come by, okay? A little bit. You know, I don't spring out of bed anymore, okay? I roll out and then crawl up on the bed and then start walking, okay? That's the way, that, that's just the way, I don't know, life's changed for me, okay? Now, you guys probably, you're like spring chickens. Y'all probably jumping out, okay? Speaking of chickens, we're going to have some next week at, at, for the petting zoo, Okay? We're going to have more than just chickens, but we're going to have some chickens, okay? They're keeping me up at night right now, I'm telling you. They're in my house, okay? And they're, they're petting. <laughs> I'll just have to tell you the story. We were at the feed store, and so we, we had to get chicken. We got some chickens and some ducks, and we got some other animals coming. I think we have a goat and a lamb. We have stuff that's coming for kids to pet on. And so uh, we were getting two chickens, and so... Tisa and I are together, and Tisa says, uh, you know, how many chickens do y'all want? We said, two. She said, it's for the petting zoo at the church. He says this, must be a really small church if you're only getting two chicks. <laughs> it's kind of judgmental. He's like, what? That's what he said. I thought that was funny. So we have other things. So we, we splurged and brought three chickens. So we got three of those. <laughs> We're like, yeah, you're right. Sorry, my lack of faith. We're going to get three this year. <laughs> We're going to go up. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start shopping somewhere else. <laughs> but anyway, so that threw me off. Anyway, so, so we're, we're springing. The love of God is springing out of us. How did I get to a chicken on that? I don't know where I went with that. Okay. But, and, and, and that love of God just flows out of us. It flows. Also, you can say this. It flows like a spring. At like a, a creek or a river that brings life to everywhere that it flows, where the trees and, and begin to grow near it, and there's, there's you know, the, the nutrients for life that exist there. And so that love of God starts flowing out of us. Uh, and, we, and we just, it, it begins to say a little bit where we are spiritually. We're like, I, I can see the love of God in you. I think you're changing. I think you're growing. I think you're different. There's just something different about you. I see love the love of God. See, the Lord wants us to be loving people and he wants that to, to flow out of us. You're a better picture of God whenever you love each other. And if God's people can't love each other, then we're not really being the testimony that God wants us to be because our love shows that we love God. Our love towards each other shows how much we love God. So it's important for us as God's people to love each other. And so that's why we encourage you to be connected to a fellowship of believers where you can be a part of, of what's going on. It's just a testimony of what God is doing in you, okay? It's a testimony of the joy and the fulfillment that we have in Christ. Well, Scripture says this in 1 Peter 3, 8. It says, and now this word to all of you, you should be like one big happy family, full of sympathy towards each other, loving one another with a tender heart and a humble mind. So God's people should be like one big, happy family. Okay, some people say to me, why do you think the church, why are you always talking about the church should grow? I said, well, the Bible says we're supposed to be a big, happy family, right? Okay, that's not the only reason, but that's a reason. Okay, <clears throat> because we always want to be growing. We always been re There's always room for someone else to be loved. All right, there's always room for someone else to be accepted. We have to leave space for someone else to come in and to be connected with the Lord. And we want to be one big, happy family. How many of you want to be a part of a sad family? All right, I don't. I'll leave that to you. You can go be a part of a sad family. I want to be a part of a happy family, okay? <clears throat> because our love for each other is a testimony of the joy that God has put inside of our heart. And we begin to show that to each other, that then the rest of the world gets get seized that, oh, these guys got something special or something between them. There's some connection. They just enjoy being with each other. There's a fellowship. There's a testimony about them. They're, they're talking about the love of God, even in the way they live their lives. And, the, and I love that verse. It says that we need to have with tender hearts 
and humble minds. There's something about that reminds me of Elvis Presley. It's like, we got to go Elvis, you know. Love me tender. <laughs> love me blue or love me humble. You know, I think that would work, right? You know, we just got to go Elvis. Our legs start shaking a little, you know, and, 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 and we start going Elvis. I won't show you a lot of that, but just a little bit like shake. Uh, and so we, we got we to go Elvis. We got to get a little bit humble. We got to get a little bit tender. Uh, the church sometimes is good at being bold and opinionated. But sometimes we forget to be tender, humble, loving towards each other. Because remember, God loved us first. See, part of the reason we love him is because he demonstrated love. So if we're not demonstrating love, <clears throat> we're not really showing the depths of the heart of God. And these are really hard times to show love. Why? We feel like everything we believe is being attacked. If we're not careful, we'll forget to love. It's more important that we love each other maybe now than ever. That the love of God is just inside of us. Okay? So, if, if, if we're going to be living in God's love, just as we live in God's word, we also live in God's love, um, then <clears throat> we're going to have to fully love God. And then we're also going to have to fully love other Christians, other believers. It's a testimony of what we believe. It, it, our, our, our love towards each other shows the passion of an Elvis song. See, Elvis always sung with passion. Okay, set the standard for the future of rock music, right? Okay, what, what was really the driving force behind it? It's just the passion for it they had. God's people should, should show that, that passion, that love towards each other. We, we love and we accept each other and adore each other. Um, there's, a, there's a third thing that we have to do, and that is that we have to fully love those far away from God. Oh, pastor. No, you're challenging me now. I mean, I can see us loving each other. We're believers, but those unbelievers, semi-woke, crazy people believe weird stuff. Are you kidding me? I'm supposed to love them? Yeah, we are. Remember, Jesus, Jesus loved us while we were still sinners. We went to the cross, and he died for us. And so we have to love those far away from God. Okay. Jesus gave us the example to love those that don't know him yet. Pray that they might, but love them when they don't. Okay? Uh, Ephesians 5.2 says, Be full of love for others. Following the example of Christ who loved you and gave himself to God as a sacrifice to take away your sins. Oh, I like that. And God was pleased for Christ's love for you was like a sweet perfume to God. It, it came to heaven. It reached heaven. It was like a, a sweet incense that was burnt. And it was pleasing to the Lord. Okay? See, Jesus gives us the example. I love this. I don't even have to come up with the illustration because Jesus illustrated it for us. Okay? Jesus did it. He, he, he gave us the example. And the example is you. Isn't that great? You are the example. I mean, he died for you when you didn't deserve him to die for you. He loved you when you didn't deserve his love. He's an example of the love of God. This is for you, sinner. Oh, because we all are. Remember, we all are. We've all sinned. This is for us, sinners, even the pastor. It's for us. This, this love that Jesus had for us, even while we were sinners, was a sweet aroma for God. It was a perfume for God. Why does God need perfume for us? Because our sin makes us stink. That's why. What does perfume do? It covers up the stink. Right? Sort of. Okay. Now, I know you usually put it on after you've bathed, so there's not as much stink. Okay. But it works in a jam. Uh, and, and so it, it, just, it just covers the junk up. It covers the, the, the stink up. The love of God just has a way of taking care of our mess as humans and people that fall short 
of God's glorious idea for us that he wanted for us. Jesus says, I love the lost sheep so much, I would abandon the herd to go take care of one that was lost. Scripture says this, so Jesus illustrates to us. Jesus encourages us to have a heart of a shepherd and to care for lost sheep. That's my point. Let me make it first. And then the Scripture in Luke 15, 4 says, so Jesus used this illustration. If you had a hundred sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost one until you found it? I don't know. Maybe most people wouldn't, but Jesus would. Jesus said, this is the way our love should be. We should have the same love for lost people that Jesus would have for those that were not yet committed to Christ or maybe were far away from Jesus. And Jesus says, I would go for the lost. I would abandon the herd and I would go, what does he say? I would go into the wilderness for a lost person. Wow. Abandon those 99 and move out for that one. And he doesn't mean just I'll go and look out the window and like, eh, eh, don't see him. Don't guess they're there. That's not what he said. Not as there. He, he, he said, no, I would go out into the wilderness. Now I'd, go, I'd go out beyond what was safe. I'd go into the wilderness for him. Okay? We, you know, I mean, shepherding in those days was a hard thing. It's not, you know, it's not like shepherding sheep in Ines, okay? No, they would go into the barren wilderness, okay? Where you might, it wasn't unusual for a shepherd to maybe run across at a point of danger and sometime in his life a bear or even a lion. Those could all be in that countryside, okay? They, they could get under attack really, really quick. They were, willing just to go, they were willing to go out into the wilderness. Jesus was willing to go into the wilderness for us. Wow. That, that, that's a love. And we're supposed to have that same kind of love for people that are far away from God. Okay? In fact, the scripture, to, Paul tells us this in the Bible, that you need to make most of your time with the unbelievers so that you might influence them. Okay? I love this scripture. It says in Colossians 4, 5 in the Living Bible, make the most of your chances to tell others the good news. Be wise in your contacts with them. Pay attention when you're around people that don't know God. Be careful what you say. Don't go out there and just offend everybody. Be careful with your contact, okay? Now, what does that tell us? I mean, because I've heard people tell me, well, Jesus, you know, he, he took the time with sinners. He'd go into the house of sinners. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean Jesus was out partying hardy with all the sinners? No, it does not mean that, okay? You know, because the scripture says, you know, you know, be helpful to the unbeliever. Some of you guys are helping them out. You're like, yeah, I'm going to help them. I'm going to help them get rid of some of these margaritas right here. Let's just get these out. I'm, I'm helping the unbelievers. You know, there's enough people knocking out margaritas, all right? You don't have to get too deep in that, okay? No, no, no. That's not what you're there for. You're not there for that. You're there to be a positive influence in their life for God, okay? That's okay, all right? Do that. You know, I just think we use it for an excuse sometimes to live on the wrong side of the rat, you know, the track. You know, that's not okay. All right? But, but God wants us to be careful how we influence those that are far away from him. And we have to be sure that we love them. Okay? Sometimes the church has to approach those who live in sinful lifestyles in a way that we have a tear in our eye. Okay? We got to hurt for them. We got to really feel like I wish God was in them. I wish something was different for them. I wish they could live this way instead of that way that's outside of God's will. And if they don't feel that we really love them, our testimony to them will not be good. It's easy to come across like I just condemn. No, no. I don't have to accept their lifestyle. Okay? But the Bible says I do have to love them. I have to love them. I have to want them to experience the changes that God has brought to my life. And we will never be the influence in this world that God wants us to be if we don't learn how to love the sinners. I'm not saying agree with them. I'm not saying party with them. I'm not saying walk with them. I'm not saying accept what they think. I'm just saying 
Sometimes we just got to draw the lines and say, well, this is where God says the line should be. But I want you to know that I still love you. And I'll love you to the day that you cross that line. And I'm praying that someday it might happen for you. That you might even make a shift. You see, the way culture begins to change is really one heart at a time. It's God making an influence. God making a difference in someone's life and them accepting Christ and coming to him and begin to change the way that they live and live the way that God wants them to live according to Scripture. And learn to live in the Word as we learn to live in the love. And if we're living in that balance, because it is a balance of God's Word and God's love, then we become the testimony that God wants us to become. So I challenge us, I challenge you, I challenge us as a church to really learn to live that. We'll always wrestle with that. We'll wrestle with it until the glorious time that Jesus brings it all to an end. And when he does, don't worry. We won't be complaining. We'll be celebrating. (laughs) We'll be happy. I know it's hard to remember that. I think sometimes, Lord, this is not going to end good. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Don't forget, it ends good. Okay, because it ends with God's people in the presence of the Lord and the Lord fighting for them. So that's an awesome place to be. We got to trust it and we just got to live in God's love. Okay, let's bow our heads together for a time of prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want us to reflect on the love of Christ. Remember what he's done for you. Remember that you had your own sin, your own problems, your own emptiness, your own brokenness. And remember that before you ever solved that problem, Jesus went to the cross for you. He died for your sin. But thank God that you came to a relationship of forgiveness of sin with God through Jesus. And that your sin was taken away and now you live in the fullness of Christ. Forgiven. Let that drive us to love each other. Let that drive us to love those that still need that. Let that be the center of how we live our lives. Committed to that cause of love. The love of Jesus. Just commit yourself to that. Maybe you're one, the one lost sheep. Or one of the lost sheep. And maybe you need Christ. Well, why don't you trust him and believe him today? Maybe you just forget how much God loves you sometimes. Recommit yourself to that love. Live to that love. Live for it. And maybe you just forget to love those around you and you forget how much they do need God and you forget to be the influence that God wants you to be. Commit to being that influence. Whatever your commitment is, make it to Jesus right now. I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. All right, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word that you've given us and help us to be people of that word. And also today, God, we thank you for your love and help us at the same time be people of love. It's a hard balance. So let us trust you with the epics and with the times And let us be committed to be your people about your purposes. Committed to what you're doing in our world. And God, give us great, great Easter next week as we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.